The following reading is from an exposition of the Sermon on the Mount by Arthur W. Pink. Matthew seven twenty one and following. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works? Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it didn't fell, for it was founded upon a rock. With these words, our Lord commences the twelfth and final division of this notable sermon. It was perhaps the most searching and solemn section in it. Here the one who cannot be imposed upon by any deceit makes known his inexorable demand for reality. Here the one who shall officiate as a judge of all the earth declares that at the grand essaise all who have deceived themselves and deluded others will stand forth in their real characters. Here the one who knows every thought and imagination of the heart before whose omniscient eye all things are naked and opened makes it crystal clear that lip service is worthless and that even the most imposing deeds count for nothing or vital and practical godliness is lacking. The more this passage be thoughtfully pondered the less surprised are we that so many seek to get rid of the sermon by terming it Jewish and insisting it is not for this dispensation. If it be true that Matthew 5 to 7 is more hated by our moderns than any other portion of God's word, it is equally true that none is more urgently needed by them. Never were there so many millions of nominal Christians on earth as there are today. And never was there such a small percentage of real Christians. Not since before the days of Luther and Calvin, when the Great Reformation affected such a grand change for the better, has Christendom been so crowded with those who have a form of godliness but who are strangers to his transforming power. We seriously doubt whether there has ever been a time in the history of this Christian era when there were such multitudes of deceived souls within the churches who verily believe that all is well with their souls when in fact the wrath of God abides on them. And we know of no single thing better calculated to undeceive them than a full and faithful exposition of these closing verses of our Lord's Sermon on the Mount. The relation of this passage to the context is easily determined. Taking the more remote one, this final section forms a fitting conclusion to the whole address, which, be it remembered, was delivered in the hearing of the multitude, though more immediately to his disciples. It was a most suitable climax. Christ had commenced by delineating the character of those who were approved of God, and he finished by describing those upon whom eternal judgment will fall. In this we may see how the chief of the apostles pattern his ministry after the example of his master. If on the one hand love constrained him, on the other hand it was by the terror of the Lord that he sought to persuade men. So when standing before Felix, he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment, 
so that the governor trembled. X 24, 25. Alas, how little of this faithful dealing with souls is there in this degenerate day. How little probing of the conscience. How little plain speaking of the awful doom awaiting the ungodly. How little shaking them out of their fatal complacency. If we look at the more immediate context, we shall be increasingly impressed with the appropriateness of the solemn peroration. Our Lord had just uttered warning against a false prophet who are to be recognized by the fruits which they bear, or in other words, by the converts which they make. The disciples, they draw after them. It is the antinomian beguilers who are there more specifically in view, as is clear from our Lord's words, which come to you in sheep's clothing, thereby concealing their real character. In like manner, their adherents assume a sanctimonious pose and employ the most pious language, carrying a Bible with them wherever they go and being able to quote it freely. They refer to the Redeemer in most reverent terms, being particular to accord him his title of Lord. Nevertheless, when weighed in the balances, they are found wanting, for they are lacking in vital godliness. Their hearts are not renewed. Their wills are not surrendered to God. Their conduct corresponds not with their high pretensions. It is the juxtaposition of Matthew 7, verse 19. In Matthew 7.20, he enables us clearly to perceive the scope of the latter. Though the Savior had said in verse 16, you shall know them by their fruits, he repeats this identifying mark of these deceivers of souls in verse 20. And then immediately adds, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom. The intimate connection then between these two sections of his address is too plain to miss. The converts made by the false prophets are big talkers, but little doers. They claim to be devoutly attached to Christ, but their claim is invalid, being unsupported by the evidence which is necessary to give it credibility. Their fine talk is not corroborated by a Christian walk. Therefore, it is insufficient to obtain for them an entrance into his kingdom. If the blind follow the blind, both fall into the ditch. It takes something more than a sheep's clothing to make one a servant of Christ, and something more than lip service is needed before he will own anyone as a true disciple of his. It is empty and windy professors whom he here exposes. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Let us consider first the application of these words to those who were immediately addressed. Many of the Jews were so impressed by the miracles wrought by Christ that they were disposed to be his disciples while ignorant of and in fact strongly opposed to his doctrine concerning salvation and the requirements of the kingdom of God. When he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them. John 2, verses 23 and 24. Nicodemus expressed the attitude of some of the more influential when he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. 
For no man can do these miracles that you do, except God is with him, John 3, 2. But so far from allowing Nicodemus to entertain the idea that an acknowledgement of him as a teacher sent from God would secure for him the blessings he came to bestow, he told him frankly that except he were born again, he could neither see nor enter the kingdom of God. When Christ had fed the great multitude with the five loaves and the two small fishes, so deeply were they impressed that we are told that these men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Yet when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force and make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. John 6, verses 14 and 15. This it was which directly occasioned the searching declaration of the section which is now before us. Very far was he from taking advantage of a temporary and superficial bias of men in his favor. Plain speaking and honest dealings characterized the whole of his transactions with his countrymen. It was to prevent them from imagining that they're coming to him as a prophet, or even acknowledge him as a Messiah, in the sense that they understood the term, was sufficient that he here impressed upon his hearers that they must be actually and personally doers of God's will before they were qualified to participate in the blessings of a spiritual and eternal kingdom. While the verses before us were addressed first and locally to the Jews of Christ's day, yet it is obvious that they have a far wider application that they belong to the Gentiles of our day. As we have proceeded through the sermon section by section, we have endeavored to point out again and again and make clear the force and relevancy of our Lord's words as they respected his immediate hearers, and also their pertinency to and bearing upon ourselves. There was nothing provincial or evanescent in the teaching of Christ. It was designed for all nations and for all generations and by it all men will yet be judged. John twelve forty eight. This declaration of Christ's, then, is full of important instruction to all in every country and in every age, wherever the gospel is presented to the examination and reception of men. It was true at the beginning. It is just as true today and will continue so long as the world lasts, that some, yea many, will go no further than a mere lip profession, and consequently will be excluded from the kingdom. And that only those who really perform the divine will shall enter into the enjoyment of the blessings of Christianity. This expression, the kingdom of heaven, need not detain us very long, for we have explained its meaning in previous chapters. As it is employed here, it is synonymous with the kingdom of God in John 3, 3, as a comparison of Matthew 18, 3 and Luke 18, 17 clearly proves. It had reference to the new order of things introduced by the Messiah, being in contrast with and the successor of Judaism. That new order of things may be contemplated as beginning in this present life and perfected in the life to come. They be in two aspects of the one economy, the former we designate the kingdom of grace and the latter the kingdom of glory. Most of the older commentators understood the kingdom of heaven in the verse now before us is referring to the second aspect, 
and therefore as being equivalent to the state of celestial blessedness. But personally, we see no reason for this restriction. A mere lip profession fails to secure even a present participation in a peculiar privileges of Christianity. For it obtains neither reconciliation with God, the forgiveness of sins, nor an enjoyment of that holy happiness, which is a portion now of those truly converted. It inevitably follows that those who enter not the kingdom of grace on earth will never enter the kingdom of glory in heaven. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Or as we find it in Luke 6, 46, Why call you me Lord, Lord? This expression is equivalent to acknowledging Christ as a teacher and master, even owning him as the Son of God, the alone Savior of sinners. There is a design emphasis in the Lord, Lord, for it is meant to express not merely profession, but a decided, open, habitual profession. Thus Christ here declares that a mere verbal acknowledgement of the truth concerning his person, or a lip profession that we are his disciples, prepared to accept his teaching, however explicit, public, and often repeated that profession may be, does not open the way to the enjoyment of the special blessings of its kingdom unless it is proved to be the result of true repentance and sound conversion, and unless it be accompanied with a corresponding course of conduct in doing the will of the Father. An outward profession of the most orthodox religion is useless if it be joined not with vital godliness and sincere obedience. Even the demons owned him as the son of God, Matthew 8, 29. But what does that avail them? It scarcely needs to be pointed out that no entrance into the kingdom of God is possible unless Christ is owned as Lord. The words before us obviously imply what is very distinctly stated in other parts of Scripture that a profession of discipleship, an acknowledgement of our submission in mind and heart to Christ Jesus, is absolutely necessary in order to our enjoying the privileges of discipleship. No person who does not call Christ Lord, Lord, can enter into the kingdom of God. No man who is ignorant of his claims, who treats these claims with neglect, who rejects these claims, or who, though he may be all but persuaded that these claims are just, yet from worldly motives does not acknowledge them, no such person can participate in the peculiar blessings of his disciples, either on earth or in heaven. John Brown, to whom we are indebted for some of the things above and in what follows, you call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am, John thirteen thirteen. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God, Second John 9. But while the necessity of owning Christ as Lord is clearly implied in his words here, the truth which they more directly each is that profession, however necessary in connection with faith and obedience, cannot of itself secure a participation in the spiritual blessings of the new economy. No matter how loudly a man avows his acceptance of the teachings of Christ, unless he be a doer of the word, his avowals count for nothing. 
He who requires a heart will not be put off with shadows for the substance. The mere semblance for the reality, words instead of works. Empty compliments are not worth the breath which uttereth them. They who trust in a form of godliness, which is devoid of its power, are building their hopes upon a foundation of sand. Not only is the bare profession insufficient for the saving of the soul, but it is an insult to Christ himself. It is a horrible mockery to call him Lord, while we continue to do only what is pleasing to ourselves, to profess to obey him while we treat his commands with contempt. It is obedience which marks men as his disciples and distinguishes them from the subjects of Satan. Let us now describe the different types of professors first. There are those who are simply nominal ones. They bear the name of Christians, and that is all. They happen to have been born in a country where Christianity is a prevailing religion and where it is regarded as a mark of respectability to give some recognition and assent to it. A few drops of water were sprinkled upon them in their infancy by a preacher, and possibly they received some kind of instruction in the rudiments of religion during the days of their childhood. But after reaching maturity, excepting for an occasional visit to a church, probably at Christmas or Easter, that is as far as they go. Yet if asked to declare themselves, they readily affirm they are Christians. But that means little or nothing more than that they are not Jews, pagans, or open infidels. Such persons usually are grossly ignorant to the very fundamentals of the faith, and often the lives of a respectable heathen would put theirs to shame. Surely such people are outside the kingdom of God. They cannot participate in his blessings either on earth or in heaven, if they could. His blessings would not be spiritual ones. Second, formal professors. This class is made up of those who regard themselves as much in advance of the ones in the former. They are able to repeat some catechism, or at least give a fairly intelligent account of both the doctrine and the laws of Christ. If not members of a church, they are at least adherents and regular attenders at its services. They claim to be submissive to Christ's authority and observe all the outward acts of worship, which characterize his followers, but they know nothing of the blessedness of communion with the Lord nor is his joy their strength. Their religion is but a mental assent to an orthodox creed and going through a round of external observances. They evince no desire for the truth to have a dominating power over their affections and wills, and most of them regard as deluded enthusiasts and canting hypocrites those who regard experimental godliness as the only genuine Christianity and pant after a deeper acquaintance with God, it is plain that these two are outside the kingdom, being strangers to those operations of the Spirit which alone make us meet for it. Third, deceived professors there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet are not washed from their filthiness. Proverbs 30, verse 12. Those in this class look with pharisaical pity upon those described above. These conclude that they themselves are better taught. They place no reliance upon infant sprinkling, no subscription to the soundest confession of faith. 
Rather do they pride themselves upon an intellectual assent to the letter of the Holy Bible. They are quite sure that Christ died for them, and that they have accepted him as their personal Savior. None can shake their assurance, yet meekness and lowliness don't characterize them. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, they are strangers too. The fruit of the Spirit and practical godliness are missing from their daily lives. Their associates address them as brother or sister, and that suffices. But what does it profit me to have the reputation of being a wealthy man, if I have not the wherewithal to purchase the necessities of life? What avails it to call me a healthy person, if disease be eaten away my very vitals? If Christ bars the door of the kingdom against me, no personal assurance will give me entrance. Fourth, hypocritical professors. The number in this class, we are fain to believe, is much smaller than in the preceding ones. For them there is some hope while life lasts, but for these we can see none. Hypocritical professors are those who deliberately assume a role, they are consciously playing a part. They know that they are not Christians, but for one reason or another are anxious to make their fellows believe they are so. Some of them belong formally to one of the other groups, to the third especially. Then they discovered the emptiness of their profession or that they had been deceived. Too dishonest to disclaim themselves as Christians, they took increased pains to persuade others of their piety. Not content with the dull formal round of duties, they put on the appearance of a deep interest in the things of God and of a zeal in seeking to promote his cause. This is incomparably the vilest of the four classes we have sketched. Such conduct is no less contemptible than irrational. God cannot be imposed upon, and no affronts are likely to be more severely punished than dishonor done to his omniscience. The hypocrite's portion will be the outer darkness, where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. Fifthly, the genuine professor. This is a real Christian who enjoys the blessings of the kingdom of grace here and will be admitted to the bliss of the kingdom of glory hereafter. He is described here according to his conduct or actions. But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Two points need determining what is meant by the Father's will and what is meant by the doing of it. The fundamental part of doing the will of God is revealed in these words. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear you him, Matthew seventeen five, Where this is complied with, everything else follows, in quote John Brown. The will of the Father is perfectly na made known by the incarnate Word. For he is the final spokesman of God, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. All judgment being committed to him, the will of the Father is that we should forsake our sins, trust in his Son, take his yoke upon us, and follow him to do less, and yet call him our Lord is but horrible mockery. So perfect and intimate is the oneness of the Father and the Son that Christ goes on to say, Whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them is like one who builds his house upon a rock. Verse 24, 
in Luke 6.46. What is meant by doing the divine will? Obviously, it does not connote a perfect or flawless performance of it, for there is no Christian who has ever yet attained to such excellence in this life, though nothing short of this is a standard set before us. It means that I have surrendered my heart and will to the claims of Christ, so that I truly desire Him to reign over me and order my life. It means that I have subjected myself to His authority and that it is the prevailing bent of my mind in constant endeavor to please and honor Him in all things. It means that I genuinely aim to be both internally and externally conformed to His holy image, and that it is my greatest grief when I do those things which displease Him. It means I truly seek that my thoughts, affections, and actions are regulated by his precepts. It is not a sinless obedience which is here in view, but it is a sincere one. It is not a forced one, but prompted by love. It is not merely an external compliance with the divine commands, but a doing of the will of God from the heart. Ephesians 6, 6. Profession tested. A study in the Sermon on the Mount by A.W. Pink. Chapter 1.